Hello my little bum sniffers and welcome to another episode of Mysteries of the Unexplained. I am the queen, the princess, the Raja, Annie Gan, and here he is himself. The queen's mother, the uh, lady who <laughs> was first here and then the seconds came along, the Annies. Uh, I was here prominently on my throne first, William O'Hanlon. The lady, yes, the Queen Mother, the lady in the corner in a wheelchair with a nappy on. <laughs> Who laid the foundations of this podcast establishment and we went to rack and ruin when this uh, lady had to go. <sighs> Actually, this podcast was all my idea, really, and I don't think I ever get enough credit for it. Uh, where's the proof of that? And can you play back the tapes, please? Show me the receipt. Because I think that bitch. is in your head. How is everyone? How are you, my darling? Did you miss me? I Oh, sure I did. I did. I did. Now, go on there now. I deliberately didn't ask you how you got on on your holidays because I didn't want to hear twice. So, uh, tell me now, <laughs> uh, how did you get on in your holidays? I believe you were away. Well, like I rang you not for a podcast chat, for a general chat the other night. And he goes to yeah. me, lads, he goes to me. Oh, um, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm not being rude. I'm just not asking you about your holiday because, you know, I'll ask you on the podcast. So I was like, oh, sorry that I might say something twice and upset you. I literally listen to the same rants out of you like fucking five times a week. But thank you for asking. Um, had a wonderful <sighs> holiday, had a wonderful time. And I think somebody was asking lately, I think it was David Mills on the Facebook was asking about places to go in Ireland. And I I had said Dingle, but like every time I go back to Kerry, I'm just like blown away. Um, Went to Dingle and brought my dad out to the Blasket Islands because he had never been there. And it was fucking gas. And he kept complaining that the boat wasn't going fast enough. And I was like, Dad, like it's not a fucking speed car. Like it's a little tiny little boat going out to the islands but um oh, he was gas altogether and then my mother gave out that I didn't um I hadn't explained to her how hard it was to get off the boat into the tiny little dinghy thing that needs to bring you across to the island because oh, there's right. no proper pier so she nearly killed me she was very angry she was like you never fucking told me about this dinghy thing and I was like ah oh, sure you're gone now <laughs> you're in it now <laughs> She's, she's got a trick knee, you see. She's got a trick knee. Were you um, anyway seasick? Uh, no, not at all. I was grand. Brilliant. We were on it for three hours coming back because we went out to sea and saw humpback whale. I saw humpback whale. I was so over the moon. Oh, it was a, yes, you sent me a picture. Yeah, it was a bucket list thing to see a whale. And um, they do uh, feed off the coast of Ireland sometimes. Um, but we were really lucky to see them. And this guy put on a great show. And there was girls beside me upstairs crying on the boat. Like, they were all just so emotional. And I didn't cry, but I had a little... I had a little feeling in my chest, all the feels. Um, and I drank loads of wine and I ate loads of food. And I, um, you know, when you come back from holiday and you're like, oh, God, I'm literally like so slow now because I'm so full of like eating shit the whole time. Yeah, man, that's yeah. So um, today I've only had coffee. I'm like, I, I like a fasting. I need to, I like a fast. <laughs> Her hol- trying to shed the holiday pounds, is it? Oh, like literally. But like I look at food and I'm heavier. Like I'm just like, oh, hello, food. And it's like, there's half a stone. I have the opposite problem to you, Will. Come here. Has anything queer been happening now at, in Wexford for the week? How have you been? I've been grand. I was up in Dublin, had a lovely time. Um, and other than that, just been busy, busy, busy with the business. So, yeah. Come here. Do you miss living in, in Dublin when you were there? Were you like, oh, I'd like to be back? No, this is the first time. And I said this to my friend yesterday. We went for a walk. Um, I it was the first time I actually had been to Dublin and I was just like, oh, yeah, I don't miss it. Really? Like I didn't. Yeah, I didn't miss it. But now, in fairness, then we were saying that I did go up in the weekend and before normally I'd be up in, during the week. So it's probably a bit quieter. So it probably was like, oh, yeah. Yeah, it's a bit manic. Yeah. It's a bit manic and it's a bit manic up there. Now, you were saying that Temple Bar was like mental. It's a bit manic up there on weekends because um, in Ireland here, I don't know what it's like other places. But like people are only like, yeah, we're, we can go out again. Like yeah. you can go out again without too much fuss and stuff. So people are literally going to town on it and everybody's drunk like all the fucking time. Yeah. yeah. 
it's just and Dublin is a small city, so it's kind of like everything's compressed. Um, so it's not like a yeah. sprawling fucking city that it's like, you know, there's a bit of space. It's just like if everybody yeah, is it's going very centralized. out, they're going to a certain district in the city. And that means that it's just rammed. But it was nice for you to try and pretend to be a normal human being for a week. Yeah, just try to blend in with society. Yeah, not just have Ted and the chickens and the trees to talk to. Like, you know, like it's nice maybe to like see people. Yeah. And um, were you always the C-U-N-T? <laughs> I wasn't. Or is this just you? <laughs> I wasn't until about a teenager. And then I realised that it was really horrible growing up and I didn't really want to. And I just decided like that I would be rage and hate filled for the rest of my life. Speaking of which, thanks so much to anyone who came and joined the Patreon in the last few weeks. And your love is just buoying us up. Love where we belong. This week I would like to say hello to Vladicus. What a cool name. Thank you so much. Thank you to Arlene Morgan and thank you to Sean Ellis. Hey. Look, you're looking for a shout out every week there, Sean. We know you got engaged. Okay, the bridezilla has already begun. Congratulations. Thanks so much for joining the Patreon. Thanks so much, you guys. And I want to say thanks so much to Emma Hughes, Killian McGuinness. Hello, Killian. And Joe Craig, thanks so much for signing up this week. It means so it much. It means so much to us. It means, wait there, wait there, wait there. It means so much that you signed up, yeah. And that may be the biggest mistake <laughs> of your life. <laughs> like, I know. Well, actually, not a mistake this week because I just released yesterday's uh, Patreon and it was about uh, this this madame in Russia and she was actually fucking gas and we had a right laugh and we had a really good grinds my gears. So uh, don't forget all you new Patreons that you can write in with your grinds my gears if there's anything that particularly pisses you off that we will definitely not be able to help you with but we can give out about it for a bit, right? into us in the Patreon and tell us what grants your gears. Um, listen, uh, that's a lot of housekeeping this week. And when I'm listening to a podcast, I'm always like, would you get the fuck on with it? So yeah. I'll get the fuck on with it. I have a brilliant story. Now, no shade, no hate, please. But this is going to be a two parter, but only because, lads, I've read this book and I've had to disseminate it and try and whittle it down and I just I can't I can't I can't fit it into one but I promise you I'm gonna have the second episode with you next week real quick okay so don't be worrying keep your fucking knickers on batten down the hatches ads because here we go this is called the myrtle plantation the sweat trickled down my brow as I pushed a drooping branch out of the way and gave an encouraging little pat to the poor creature I was sat astride when the guide had said he had two strong animals available, I had imagined tall and haughty ponies. Instead, this poor little donkey was grappling with the uneven terrain, and my sympathy for him grew with each step. Jim looked over at me and smiled reassuringly. His poor animal was hardly faring any better, I thought. Perhaps mine got lucky. All of a sudden there appeared a clearing in the dense growth, and voices were coming now too, strong and excited, a kind of chant. We had come across a few women on our path through the Haitian jungle, on their way to fetch water or collect food, but it dawned on me suddenly that I had seen no men, and now their voices were unmistakable, strong, rhythmic and rolling, undulating like the ground beneath us. We cleared a final huddle of trees and there they were. They wore nothing but loincloths and face paint, and those painted faces were each one pointed skywards, the brightest blue and starkest white of the paint reflected in the air above. They danced not in sync, but somehow all as one, the fierceness of their movements both shocking and wholly natural. I felt my mouth had dropped open, and as I sat there I unconsciously began fiddling with my camera, yanking it out of its awkward case and sighting, th and sighting the scene before me just as I caught the guide's hand shooting out toward me from the corner of my eye, I clicked. The shutter snapped and a bright flash startled me as it illuminated the edges of the forest clearing. And suddenly a feeling of panic rose in my gut. We were not meant to be here. Something was wrong. The thought had not fully registered, or at least I had not decided what to do with it, when all at once the crowd of dancers swooped their heads in one united gesture and planted their gaze directly on me. It was as quick as it was decisive 
and I felt as if an arrow had landed square inside my chest. Somehow I knew that Jim and our guide had seen it too. That arrow of their gaze was meant for me and me alone. I felt the donkey flinch underneath me and pull sharply to the left and suddenly we were trotting at pace. It took me some minutes to comprehend that the guide had pulled the tether attached to the donkey's bridle and was hurrying us away from the clearing as fast as these poor unfortunate creatures could go. Jim looked behind at me, worried but smiling. I nodded to him. I'm okay. When we finally stopped, I asked the guide what happened. Why did they look at me like that? They put a curse on you, he said matter-of-factly. Why? I asked. Because you took their picture. Now they think you stole their souls. A few weeks later, we found ourselves back in Francisville, New Orleans. New Orleans was one of my favourite places. I loved its mix of southern charm, exotic influences, music and mystery. It had long been a dream of mine to purchase an old house here where there was so much history and lovingly restore it to its former glory. Several coincidences in recent weeks had led us to the doorstep of Myrtle's Plantation, a former plantation house that had fallen into some disrepair. It had survived a civil war and all that came thereafter and with its dilapidated white cupboards and blue shutters, Jim joked on seeing it that it looked just like the haunted house at Disneyland. Inside, however, the house had been partly and lovingly restored, and the results were stunning. In a French style with pastel walls, chandeliers and beautifully polished cedarwood floors, the house echoed a time long since past of wealthy owners entertaining guests lavishly. I had not been in the house 30 minutes when the first strange instance occurred. Our estate agent Betty Jo was deep in conversation with Jim about some feature or other when I heard a man's voice clearly call, Francis, Francis. I dropped my porcelain teacup quite indelicately down on its saucer. Francis, it came again, Francis. I casually mentioned it to Betty Jo, that old houses like this often have interesting histories and inquired as to whether anything unusual or notable had ever occurred here. She brushed it off with a, no, not to my knowledge. I put the hearing of voices down to fatigue and tried to think no more about it. I cannot tell you why we went ahead and purchased Myrtle's plantation the next day. I can tell you that I felt no fear except that of leaving my family and friends far behind me and beginning a new life with Jim in New Orleans. I can tell you I knew my future would lie in this place and that I was embarking on what would be the biggest adventure of my life. It was the next day as we visited the house to talk business once again that I heard strange voices in the house. Every time Jim or Betty or Joe laughed in the house, I felt as if I could hear a chorus of laughter erupting from down the hall. This time it was John, the agent handling the finance, who I asked about the voices. Again, he brushed it off, but I could tell he wasn't looking me in the eye. It hardly seemed to affect my decision at all. Jim and I were in love with the place and we began the process, signing papers and arranging the finances. It wasn't until the next night, as we met John L. at the house to go over some things, that he revealed more. (coughs) There have been a few incidences. Incidences? What kind of incidences? Well, footsteps whistling, that sort of thing. Okay, anything else? There have been voices, a, a woman's usually, like a woman's voice, I stared at him. But don't worry, it's not frightening. I nodded, dumbfounded. We were due to fly home to California to tie things up while the sale went through, and notwithstanding the strange incidences, I couldn't wait to get back to the plantation. I spent that time at home with the help of a friend gobbling up all the information I could find about the house. It was built in 1796 on top of a rolling hill that was once an ancient Indian burial grounds. General David Bradford had built the home on 600 acres and originally named it Laurel Grove, 
He lived alone there for several years before moving his wife Elizabeth and their five children to the plantation from Pennsylvania. His eldest daughter, Sarah Mathilda, inherited the house upon his death, but it was to be her own death that would be the first of a string of tragedies in the home. In 1823, she and two of her daughters were poisoned by a housemaid. Ten years later, her devastated husband could bear being in the house no longer and sold it to the Rough and Grey family of Scotland. Grey would increase the acreage and scope of the plantation, hiring more slaves and increasing the productivity of the plantation and extensively renovating the house, importing only the best houseware from Europe. He and his wife, Mary Catherine, had nine children, eight boys and a girl. I could find no further information on these nine kids, but my head was full of other things as I left Jim at home to finish tying up the sale of our house while I boarded the plane to Louisiana. I couldn't wait to get back to the house. It seemed as if it was calling me. I was overwhelmed by the hospitality of the locals when I arrived, but the excitement of my days at the house was tainted by the eerie happenings at night. I was awakened from the start by the sound of footsteps, very clearly audible in the hall and bedrooms. Lights would be turned off at night, yet I'd wake up to find the bedroom lights beaming into my eyes. I tried to rationalise it by blaming it on tricky wiring, and on the fourth night in the house, I gave up and grabbed my duvet and pillow and retired to the couch. I awoke in the darkness with an overwhelming feeling of being watched. I blinked my eyes open to see a figure standing over me by the couch. It was a woman dressed in a long dark green gown, very clearly holding a tin with a candle lighting in it. I suddenly realised the reason I could see her was because of the light coming from this very candle. Her face was dark and very square and a green turban was wrapped eloquently around her head, concealing her hair. I closed my eyes and squeezed my eyelids as tight as I could, praying, willing for her to disappear. When I opened them again, she was still there, staring at me, staring through into my soul. I closed my eyes again and began to scream and scream and scream. I don't know how long I screamed. John L, our local liaison, was staying in the house with me to help me settle in. I was sure he would come. It felt like I had been screaming for eternity. I suddenly realised he wasn't coming. Nobody was. I opened my eyes again and she was still there. I couldn't even bring myself to look in her eyes. I felt as if I would never return from that glare. I had never felt that level of fear in my life. At the same time, I knew this person couldn't possibly be real. She was from another place, another time. I don't know how, but I somehow mustered the courage to reach out and touch the fabric of her gown, still being careful not to meet her piercing gaze. As I reached the fabric of her gown, as I reached the fabric, my hand kept travelling and I realised my fingers were passing right through it. Suddenly, she was gone completely disappearing as quickly as she had arrived. The next morning I dressed in a hurry and went to find John L. I was still rattled from the night's encounter and I couldn't believe that he hadn't heard me screaming the night before. He had been the one that had told me about the voices and strange noises at the house and was sure to know more than he was letting on. I found him out on the veranda, sipping coffee as if nothing had happened. I quickly garbled my story to him in a flurry of disbelief but his reaction was even more unbelievable. Oh, Francis, don't be silly. (laughs) He chuckled. But didn't you hear me screaming? I gasped. Why didn't you come? It could have been anything. I noticed once again that he was averting my eyes. My dear, once I am asleep, I don't hear anything. I sleep like a log. I left the conversation more confused than ever but I was to gain some insight from an unexpected source that evening. Always a bastion of Southern hospitality, John had invited me to dine with him and his mother, Mrs. Emma Pierce. As we settled at the table in her quaint living room, sipping coffee from beautiful china teacups, she turned to me unexpectedly. John Ale tells me you saw a lady in a green turban. 
I almost dropped my coffee right into my lap. I glared at John, but he seemed unfazed. John L. thought that that was just fantastic. She is one of the most famous ghosts at the Myrtles. That poor woman was a housemaid there a long time ago. She had her ears cut off as a punishment for eavesdropping. But that was before she came to work at the Myrtles, of course. She wore that green turban forevermore to hide her disfigurement. Imagine that. I was speechless. John went on to tell me, nonchalantly, that the ghost in the green turban had been seen at the house on many occasions over the past century, roaming from room to room, carrying the night candle, apparently checking that everyone was safe and warm in bed. Some guests had even reported going to bed with the bed covers pulled up, only to awake covered in blankets and comforters, sometimes pulled right up over their heads completely. I gasped. Why didn't you tell me this before? I glared at John L. He looked back at me with a cool stare, but said nothing, before getting up and ushering us all out the door to dinner. What the hell was going on? I had bought this house and sacrificed everything to be here. Had I made a huge mistake? What other secrets did it hold in its walls? I was to find out over the coming months. A fan. Oh, very spooky, hooky, hokey, pokey goings on here in the Myrtle's Plantation. Might I add that I am a woman of grace and... (laughs) Uh, well, I don't like talking to peasants and having to do a voiceover with you as the narrator was one of my biggest challenges in my life. Uh, uh, does anybody know where I can get a strong drink and a handsome young man to carry my luggage? Because it's very heavy and uh, I will more than likely need his shirt to be opened a few buttons from the top so I can see, you know, get a nice view. Mm, well. Well, I totally see you in a previous life as like a Scarlett O'Hara type with a big like hoop ring dress that literally knocks over people as you walk past with your hair in like a set wave and a red lipstick and be like, bring my things in from the carriage. Oh, 100 percent. 100%. 100%. I'd love oh, to go yeah. on a... Oh, yeah, that lady. I'll actually... Do you know what? I'll say it there now. I would, I would go on a live recording of a reincarnation... What, what is it? A past life regression um, taping of my life. Oh, my God. I would definitely do that if oh I find God. somebody that would allow me to record the audio. And I could guarantee you that it will be a Southern Bell woman. <laughs> I know that for a fact. <laughs> or someone from North Fumbleland. And what, what do you think you'd look like? Because you'd have to gain a few womanly curves. Heavy like, set. Imagine if you were just... <laughs> Big bosom. Big you bosom. Heavy you set. Wouldn't be, you wouldn't be heavy set, but you'd have a pair of hips on you. Childbearing No, hips. I was definitely heavy set. Yeah. But you know now if you were, you'd have to birth a few children, they wouldn't take any of your like, I'm, um, oh, I'm waiting till I find the right man. Like you'd be married off at 18 and you'd be... You'd be pushing out the children past life regression past life regression for our will <laughs> <laughs> if anybody knows um, if anybody knows a, a hypnotist that will bring Will back to his southern bell days could they please oh you'd be going in the beauty pageants and everything like that you'd be like I'm the prettiest lady in Charlottesville I think that we should <laughs> both do this um, as two separate ep- episodes wouldn't this be gas we should actually look into this Annie do you, absolutely. Do you know what I think I was? I think I was like a sailor, like a big beardy, like like drunk of a sailor. I like I have an affinity with the sea. I just love everything about it. And I love being out on the boat. And I, I didn't get sick that last time. So that means I was definitely a big beardy kind of drunk sailor who kind of like <laughs> beat women around the place a little bit like anger issues, I think. And he went on a boat and didn't feel seasick for the first time in our life. And now was just like, I was definitely a sailor in my past I'm life. <laughs> <laughs> I'm definitely a sailor. <laughs> and you're a heavy set lady <laughs> with a big boat. But bustle. I come from money. And don't you forget it. Mm. No, Will. Okay. Come on now. None of us ever came for money. Like, it was definitely not finding us in this life. Um, what do you think of the story? Isn't this just so, like, uh, takes you to a place? Like, it's so interesting. 
Mm, very, very interesting. Very The poor housemaid was after having her ears cut off for eavesdropping. I tell you one thing, if my ears were to be cut off from eavesdropping, they'd have to start shaving bits off the side of my face because I'd be caught too many times and they'd be like, just oh shave another God. bit off the side of her skull. <laughs> <laughs> you'd have half, you'd, ju- you'd just be going around with like a nose and a mouth because the rest of you'd be after having <laughs> shaved off. <laughs> I don't even have the nose left. I don't even have and the nose. And this place, um, what is the history of this place? Like, what is, like, this house? Like, does it have some sort of... It's a, well, it's a plantation house, but it was this lady who bought the house actually finds out more about the history. So she's found out about the first two families who lived there, um, but she hasn't really found out what happened to their children. But the house does change hands many times and as she go as you go through the book she um oh. she learns more and more about the history of the place as she is encounters more and more strange things happening within its walls so they will have to find out and by the way she's here on her own because her husband yeah. is like her 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 fella she gets married to move into the house right so she's with her partner and they're together for years and they don't have kids yeah but um john l who's the fella who's kind of handing over the house but he's also staying there there until it's it's handed over which is kind of strange that's the character you so beautifully embodied he um it's back in like the 80s i think so they were like oh are you not married and uh, and they were like oh no like we're a couple but we're not married and he was like the myrtle's plantation needs a family to live here so she was kind of like, are you not going to sell us the house unless we're married? And he kind of like inferred that he wasn't. But she, the, the author seems to have like fallen in love with the house. Like it kind of cast a spell in her. So she goes off and marries your man just so they can buy the house. And uh, what book is this? I, 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 this would be right up my street. So, uh, it's by Frances Kermine. She is the lady that had this experience. And it's called The Myrtle's Plantation. This true story of America's most haunted house. Really great book actually and guys you'll have to wait till next week for a bonus episode to find out what happens to francis you can join us after the break when we ask will anything guys i know what you came for you didn't really come for scary stories you came to ask will what color his under pantaloons are today do 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 Hi Will, thanks for taking the time to join us today and thanks for coming to solve the woes of our poor listeners all over the world. We're going to get right into this. We had a great response. You guys are always have so many questions for Will. Our first question today comes in from Sean Ellis. Dear William, how would you solve a problem like Maria? <laughs> <laughs> oh thanks Sean thank you so much for your question how would I solve a problem like Maria um, I would probably sit her down and say Maria this is a convent a place of work okay you're going around here singing at the top of your voice uh, when other people are trying to <laughs> pray okay you're doing a bit of show acting I think you'd be better on the stage it's not really working out Maria don't know where you think you are the neck on you Maria coming in here this is a place of worship and you're going around there thinking that you're Liza Minnelli, <laughs> Maria. So you're a nun, Maria. Get your Maria. life together. You're a nun. <laughs> okay, get your life together. You're actually causing mayhem in here. Okay. Oh, I think that would solve the problem. Probably would. Quite nice. I think it would. I yeah, give I her a stern talk. And <laughs> That's all she needed, a stern hand. David Mill says, the dearest of all Williams, what do you consider to be your greatest personal achievement other than Motu and your thriving business, of course? <laughs> oh, God. Um, that's a very good question. Jeez, David, now. Uh, my greatest personal achievement, I suppose it would probably be that, that I'm still alive. <laughs> Yes. As in, I think, like, I suppose uh, that's quite an achievement in today's world. And lucky enough to be, have been born is. into a country that wasn't uh, ravaged with war or um, extremely poor. So that is an achievement to be lucky to have a house over my head. Yes. Uh, be able to survive. And Yes. Very valid points. And David had said to me, oh, the dearest of all Annie's, I asked this question for you last week, but I missed the cutoff point. So feel free to answer it too. I, yeah, I would say all those things. Um, 
like managing to give up the old day job kind of thing even though it's to be confirmed how that actually works out in the long run um and uh i think not ending up in a psychiatric ward at any stage like very close working in them but not actually staying in them i think for me never expected that deborah k lambert finch says dear will please describe your dream date Ooh. oh thanks deborah now okay well does this does she mean like what the dream date is in like what the person is like or the or what the date itself is oh, like i presume yeah, the date she, itself i don't know but yeah let's go for that one the date itself um do you know what i'm going to be quite boring here now i always think it's just good to have like a little coffee and a walk because if it's setting yes. over the top like if it's if it's din- if your first date is dinner it's a bit like awkward because you're eating and stuff and then the meal mightn't be nice and blah 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 that's more of a yeah. second date like a uh, dream first date is just it needs to be basic like i'd like it if it was on a gorgeous beach mm-hmm. like just walking on in the mm-hmm. evening time on a gorgeous beach Mm-hmm. I suppose I'm talking more about first dates. Yeah, my first date with Dave was on a beach, and it was actually really, it was really romantic. But I know what you're saying Did about you your walk leg? because. <laughs> yeah, but he had poo bags, so it's okay. Oh, um, right. Do you know what I think is good for you guys that are dating out there? I think it's good to go on a date where you're adjacent to somebody, but you're not like facing them the whole time. I think that's very hard to keep eye contact for a whole, like, date. Like, it's nice to go for a walk because you don't have to be, you're not, like, staring somebody in the face the whole time. You can talk more openly. Do you know what I mean? Yes, I agree with Jani. I agree with you, girl. I'm very insecure, have problems with eye contact. This is your question, not my okay. Next question. <laughs> Laura Michelle says, oh, for Laura. Hi, thanks so much. She keeps accidentally submitting this too late, so this her time's a charm. She's so sweet for actually actually submitting it again this is your moment in the spotlight laura would you rather have to use the watch your voice for everything you say for the rest of your life including sexy times saying your vows at your wedding comforting a friend when they're in need etc or let annie pick out your clothes every day for the rest of your life including sexy times your wedding comforting a friend when they're in need etc this is like maybe my favorite question ever <laughs> Uh, very good question thanks Lauren sorry we kept missing you um, would I rather I would probably rather use the watcher's voice what? for everything what? I say for the rest of my life including sexy times saying my vows at my wedding comforting a friend when they're in need you because absolutely... I would rather that than Annie dressing me in paper bags. <laughs> you absolute prick. I would dress you beautifully. Sorry, sorry. I might pick out something that's not actually black. You, what? I'm disgusted. This is getting ridiculous at this stage. The jealousy is absolutely... <laughs> it's actually, you could actually cut it with a knife at this point, guys. <laughs> Brochine is off stress leave because yeah, of you know who. She is. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I would. I would pick the watcher's voice, Annie. You absolute cunt. I've right. seen your shiny disco shoes, Annie. <laughs> I wouldn't trust you, <laughs> guys. I had a pair of silver boots that I love, and every fucking time, shiny every fucking disco, ta- disco, disco, <laughs> time shiny I wore disco them, balls. I got absolutely savaged for them, and it like it's not fair. I still have them. Vanessa Eberly says, answer this mystery. If it were raining men, do you think they were sucked up in a tornado or hurricane and dumped somewhere new? Oh my gosh. <laughs> Thanks, Vanessa. I also love your little video that you did of the She-Wolf Shakira dance that you sent in oh live. Oh my god! fucking gas. <laughs> and the gas. one of the Roshin song in your car. Please keep them coming. Um... <laughs> Uh, I probably would think that they had been sucked up in a tornado because <laughs> mm. a hurricane would just blow you around whereas a tornado has the power to suck you right up. Yes. And I would imagine that they would have been at some sort of like men's convention or <laughs> a gay nightclub because you're going to get a high concentration of gay men at that. And then if it was raining, then they obviously were going to be dumped later I on. tell you one thing, you'd um, be I running right into that storm. You'd be running right into the middle of it, butt naked, like the day you were born. I am sick of your homophobic comments, Annie. You are cancelled. <laughs> <laughs> Cancel her. 
How dare you come, come at me when I'm telling my truth and my journey and my authentic journey self. Yeah, my authentic self. Is it I tell you, journey? I tell you one thing. I tell you one thing. This is a journey that I'm on. I tell you another thing. It's definitely authentic. <laughs> <laughs> authentic <laughs> and an Irish accent is the same so authentic um, Kat Barnett says how would you address a mansplaining co-worker oh this grinds my gears if this is Will's week and it is please feel free to respond as the watcher I this watcher thing is getting out of control <laughs> out of control <laughs> I feel like he's a separate entity now <laughs> like it's going to have to be a separate podcast or something um Mansplaining co-worker uh, <laughs> I don't Can I do this in the watch of us uh, if, if I had a co-worker It was mans <laughs> I can't <laughs> do this in that Sorry guys um, I like I, I just would Could not I cannot bear Straight men that are like this I'm I know sorry. It's a lot I of cannot them. cannot bear I know. It is one of my pet hates. It drives me up the fucking walls. My cortisol levels probably <laughs> come out the top of my head. I just cannot. I just cannot deal with this. So I, what I do is just leave the situation. I yeah. can't. I can't. And I try to remove myself from their presence as much as I can. Because it drives me. It drives me batty. And Will, why do you think men, why do you think a lot of men do it? Like, do they actually think that people around them are so thick that they can't understand basic concepts? Or do you think that it's their own insecurity just trying to make them sound knowledgeable? The latter. They, like, it's from a lack of confidence. It is 100% from a lack of confidence because they're trying to make themselves appear uh, knowledgeable and, like, smart. Um, and it's, yeah. and it's like this like that's literally that's just it it's like when someone goes on like that I'm just like oh they have no confidence okay and yeah okay right yeah. and now they actually are starting to believe their own bullshit oh now they're turning into an arrogant <laughs> prick oh they're a dickhead oh they're a complete dickhead okay oh they haven't a clue okay I'm gonna go now I know I know yeah I can't I, I know. can't do and do you know I can't understand partner like I can't understand partners who just I think some partners know that their partner is like this and they just kind of have to um, erect this kind of wall this glaze over kind of thing that when they start doing it because you see do you see partners of people like this and when they start doing it the other person just kind of like looks away and just just doesn't address it just that's it it just has to pass over their head or else you'd probably kill a, you'd kill a bitch wouldn't you you'd kill a bitch you'd, you'd kill a bitch yeah that's one of the one things now I told you about the whole space thing um, that you know I was like would I go to Mars if Elon was like asking me if anybody would they like to go to Mars you can go for free and I was like if I was on that spaceship stuck beside one of these fellas for like nine months I would open the airlock and kill everybody <laughs> I would <laughs> I'd be like I don't care I'm going down these are all going to do it with me I would do it. I'd open the airlock, Annie. For those of you who don't know, it's a dream of Will's to go to space. He's very excited about the the SpaceX thing that just happened. And um, I I, I think that he thinks it's bringing him one step closer. Little does he know that he's actually moving backwards in all aspects of his life. But sure, listen, I bet you got to have a dream. And Maybe I'll be the first gay man in space. Oh, that would be so a kid. Imagine um, my outfit. Actually, I'm not <laughs> why I'm would actually Will? Not camp. I wouldn't your your that. your outfit would have to just be a spacesuit. But I suppose you could put glitter or something on it. No, anyway, I wouldn't do that. You uh, know, no, you would. wouldn't. Be uh, that. Yeah. Oh wait, wait, wait. Oh, uh, what? no, Roshin's off sick. Oh, Roshin's Annie, off would sick you go over near to... the airlock there and just make sure that it's closed there? <laughs> just turn it all the way to open and then step outside. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Sorry, I'm going to have to walk over Where's to the Where's Annie? Desk. I don't know. I'm actually going to have to walk over to the desk and collect this news report myself. I'm just, I'm walking. I'm walking. <laughs> There's a piece of paper. I'm coming back. I'm coming. I'm back at my seat. Boop, 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 boop. Alleged pizza. P- boop, boop. Alleged pizza roll pooper apprehended after Oklahoma grocery store incident. 
Yes, some people may find the below description of the crime offensive. Please hold on to your tighty whities Shirley Wright Johnson had a crappy shopping experience on Wednesday. Literally. Wright Johnson said she was picking up some items in a grocery store in Moore, Oklahoma with her two daughters when she reached for a bag of frozen pizza rolls. She quickly discovered something else in her hand. Human excrement. I picked up a bag of pizza rolls and there's literally shit, she said in a video. Human shit, excuse my language. Someone defecated inside a oh supermarket freezer onto a bag of Totino's pizza rolls, then covered the mess with another package of the treats. Police told the TV station, I grabbed the bag. It felt smushy on the bag. So I turned it over and there it was. <laughs> right, Johnson said. I was upset. I was disgusted. I feel like I was violated. The ride home was miserable, she said, even though she quickly scrubbed her hands. All the way home, my kids were like, Mom, I can smell it. <laughs> I can smell it. I'm like, I smell it too, baby. <laughs> she told me. She told Oklahoma City CBS, It's just disgusting. That's the only word I can use. It's disgusting and horrible. More police using a surveillance video from the scene of the crime flushed out a man they identified as a person of interest. He was booked into the Cleveland County Detention Centre on unrelated charges while the poop probe continues. A police spokesperson told the smoking gun that the man's name would be released if formal charges are filed. The man was also reported taking pictures of women in the grocery store, police added. Boop, 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 boop. <laughs> this is the night. For Philly's Bizarre News, please join us next week for more Bizarre News. <laughs> That's it. We thought the medication was after making a difference. And I actually had a conversation with your mother saying that you were getting on really, really good. Today, today, I think that you either have stuff taking the medication or it needs to be changed. It's, I think it's One the holiday. The I think it's like, I think it's messed up my regimen. <laughs> hey, come here, come here. What's a pizza <laughs> roll anyway? A pizza roll? I don't know. Yeah, like, what's a pizza, just roll? a pizza roll? just a pizza roll. <laughs> there's a ba- there's a ba- there's a picture of these Totino's pizza rolls here and they look like very small little things. Can anyone can anyone please tell me what a pizza roll is? Obviously the human poop bit, I know that that's not meant to be in it, but like what's is that a thing? Hey, like what are we doing with our lives? <laughs> I oh, I know what I'm doing with mine. I don't know what the fuck you're doing with yours. You need to look in the mirror, love. Have a good look at yourself and see what the fuck is going on. You understand me? Yeah, it's me back again. I'm here to read you to fruit. <laughs> you sad, sad little girl. <laughs> Finding disgusting stories to tell to other people. What's gotten into you? If your parents could hear you, they'd have a right laugh, wouldn't they? You're a silly sausage. What you like? Go make yourself another cup of tea and down it with a few chockies. It's the only way you feel a bit of warmth, uh, isn't it? I think I would. I actually think, oh, wow, that last little bit stung. <laughs> it's what we have both done for most of our lives, at least have a cup of tea and a chockey. <laughs> Makes everything better. Also want to say a big thank you to the two people that sent in reviews this week to us, which was very much appreciated. Uh, the first one is from Pyrotech. No, it's not Pyrotechnic. Pyroticus? Pyroticus. I don't know. I'm sorry. Annie has the best cackle. <laughs> Insert cackle. Five stars. <laughs> I, cons- I consume sorry. a lot of true crime slash paranormal <laughs> podcasts and this one makes me laugh the hardest. Mixing comedy with serious subjects isn't easy, but Will and Annie do it best. Ah, oh, thank you so much. Thank you so much. Oh, thank you so much. And thank you for saying, for liking my cackle because I know that it's a love-hate thing and I have lost many a friend over it no I haven't but I know it. I can't help it but thanks so much for liking it I love you thanks for your review the second one comes in from Sir Sharowex 
And she, sorry, I butchered that, uh, writes and says, <laughs> how do you review perfection? Five stars. Have been listening to Motu for months now and cannot get enough of Annie and Will. They are the perfect blend of all that is awesome. Paranormal, they got you. Mystery, they got you. Bizarre news, they got you. Sarcastic humour, they got you. Fun, hilarious and always entertaining. These two BFFs are friendship goals. Favourite part of the week. Oh, thank you Aww. so much. Um, <laughs> oh, I'm going to go on a and, cry. Uh, yeah, thank you so much. And if you haven't done so already and you would like to, we would love if you could send us in a review on Apple Pod- Podcasts and we'll read them out on the show. Thank you. Feeling the love this week. It's absolutely wonderful. And it kind of makes my eye a little bit more watery. And they're normally very, very dry. And sometimes I think mm-hmm. I need glasses because they're so dry. Mm-hmm. But then most things about you are dry. Your humour, your pocket, your nether regions. Now, listen, that's been a lot. <laughs> that's your been... vagina. Hey, that is a chemical yeast imbalance, sir, and I'm thanking not to bring it up again. Well, 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 will you put yourself to some fucking use there and tell people? Tell people where to find us. You can find us at www.williamohanlon.com where you can buy <laughs> all the resources. Actually, don't go there because it's not even... It's not a, of my You can bum sign bum up for my OnlyFans <laughs> private account, which is not operated with OnlyFans. You will get explicit content. No, um, don't go to that website. I have nothing to do with it. Oh, I actually want to search that in now. Could be really bad or could be good. <laughs> anyway, don't buy it from that site because it's not me live yet officially. But if you want me to, if there's demand, I would. Um, you... Well, I'm, Annie, I'm telling people where they can find us. <laughs> <laughs> if you want more, 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 more. How do you like it? How do you like it? You can go to patreon.com forward slash mysteries of the unexplained. You can find us on Instagram. You can find us on Facebook. And you know what? All the links are actually in the show notes of this episode. So just press the little button on details and you will find everything. And just press the link and you will find us. Hey, 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 hey. Why don't you like and subscribe? <laughs> oh my god, that's so creepy. You didn't say that. That was something else. Uh, I'm that losing my like, fucking shit here. Was, I have to go. Like, hey, hey, I'm a little girl. Why don't you like and subscribe? I'm just a girl. Like, that was weird. <laughs> You're weird. Your fucking face is weird. You don't hear me going on about it the whole time. Thank you so much and join us next week for more. Mystery. Explain, explain, explain. This tune's gonna punish you, punish you, punish, punish, punch. punch, punch. Ice cream, yeah, your mind. Yeah. <laughs> Trumpet it out, yeah, love. <laughs>